we will move right into the discussion. This session will be chaired by uh, Jeho Bay of Yonghin University, and we have two discussants, Professor Maya Stiller from University of Kansas, and also via Zoom, we have uh, Ksenia Chuzova, professor uh, at Princeton University. Let's begin the discussion session. Hello, I am uh, Jeho Bei. Once again, I will briefly introduce the presenters. We had uh, Kwang Hee Shin, uh, Myung Hee Jung, Bo Yeon An, and Da Hee Jung. As discussants, we are joined by Professor of Korean Art History at University of Kansas, Professor Maya Steeler. I think I've introduced, uh, they have been introduced, and according to what I was informed, uh, Professor Maya Steeler had two PhDs one in uh, University of Berlin and another from uh, University of California. Pre-modern and modern Buddhist art history is her main uh, research area. And in 2021, she was awarded the Patrice Evely. Oh, oh, actually, there was a book that was awarded the Patrice Evely Award. And well, the carving status of Kumgangsan elite graffiti in pre modern Korea was a book that was awarded the Patricia Berkeley Every Award. And we have another discussant. Uh, are you here with us via Zoom? Is she connected? Uh, I guess. Yeah. Uh, I'm here. Uh, Oh, you are here with us. Okay, I will introduce uh, our second discussant as well. We have Professor Ksenia Chisova from Princeton University, uh, the Department of East Asian Studies. Once again, Professor Ksenia Chisova, it's great to have you here. Her research for a PhD, she acquired her PhD at Columbia University in Literature and Cultural History of Pre-Modern Korea. I haven't read into the papers, but she puts together the research methods for literature and culture to explore the Korean literature and texts from 17th century until now to look at issues surrounding gender, uh, women, and family. She has published a book named Kinship Novels of Early Modern Korea between genealogical Call time and the domestic everyday. So she was the author of the book and she is still proliferatively writing books. It is very late in the evening on Thursday night, probably around 1030. So she is staying up to join us as a discussant, so I appreciate uh, her attendance. The discussion will proceed as follows. The 
presenters of session one and two will answer questions, starting with those on session one presentations. So questions will be posed, we will hear answers from presenters, and then we will hear questions on session two presentations, and then we will hear answers. If we have more time, we have participants online, so perhaps we could open up the mic to them and well if we have any questions from uh, participants abroad I think it would serve our interest to hear their uh, thoughts on uh, Korea's Buddhist art so why don't we uh, prioritize any questions that they might have and then open up the mic to the floor and if we still have more time I will pose some of my own questions so why don't we dive right in to the panel discussion uh, giving the mic over to oh actually I need have one more announcement <laughs> professor Maya Steeler is on a sabbatical and that is why she is here so uh, after listening to her discussion, please reach out to her and uh, acquire guidance from her. Thank you. Uh, yes, I will read my discussion paper in English. The presentations by Dr. Jung Myung Hee and Dr. Shin Gwang Hee provide a wonderful introduction to the first day of our conference on gender in Korean art. The presentations beautifully complement each other while Dr. Jung provides a broad overview of the representation of gender in pre-modern Korean Buddhist art and focuses on the ritual dimensions of Buddhist paintings, Dr. Shin zooms in on a group of early Joseon period paintings, meticulously examining their iconographic components and their political relevance within the context of the royal court. Dr. Shin's paper advances the argument that the paintings titled Sokka Tansengdo and um, or Birth of Shakyamuni Buddha and Leaving the Palace, Yusun Tulga Do, were commissioned by Queen Dowager Chonghi and Queen Insu. She bases this argument on a close visual comparative analysis of various versions of these themes from the Ming and Joseon dynasties. Additionally, Dr. Shin skillfully connects the production of these paintings to a broader tapestry of religious activities at the royal court of Joseon, including the printing of Buddhist texts. Dr. Zhang's presentation provides much more than an in-depth discussion of the depiction of female figures in Kamnodo, as the title of her paper suggests. Her paper also extends to various gender aspects in pre-modern Korean Buddhist art, such as paintings featuring female figures and female patrons sponsoring the production of Buddhist paintings and sculptures. Particularly noteworthy is Dr. Zhang's discussion of female patrons from non-elite backgrounds, especially court ladies and female entertainers. A more profound exploration of Buddhist paintings commissioned by non-elite patrons, such as court lady Kim Song Mae or female entertainer Myo Jong, promises to be an invaluable avenue for future scholars. I've categorized my questions for both presenters into three themes. Firstly, the broader implications of their research. Secondly, their search for connections between image and text. And thirdly, and more broadly speaking, um, the ritual function, spatial context, and target audience of the discussed artworks. While both papers provide valuable detailed descriptions of excellent paintings, sculptures, and woodblock prints, I'm wondering about the wider ramifications of this research for the fields of East Asian art history and gender studies. For example, Dr. Shin mentioned that in the uh, Ojibi Changjeon, dating from the Koryo period, Queen Maya is depicted bending her head to look at the first steps of Shakyamuni. Dr. Shin points out that this differs from the way the scene of Shakyamuni's birth is depicted in 15th century Joseon. What are the implications of this iconographic shift in the broader East Asian context? And in her discussion of Kamnodo, Dr. Chang mentioned the issue of clearly identifying the gender of monks and nuns. 
Why scholars generally agree that human figures with beards or long eyebrows can be identified as monks or arhats, and those with parts of their faces colored with shades of pink pigment have been identified as nuns, the identification of figures with hoods on their heads as nuns has been questioned. And it says scholars have suggested that these figures should be identified as young monks. The question is why did um, late Joseon painters or Joseon period um, Buddhist painters paint these um, figures in this way? Why is it so ambiguous? And what are the implications of these ambiguous depictions um, in Joseon period Kam no Do in the broader East Asian Buddhist context? Another compelling thread woven into both presentations deals with the potential nexus between Buddhist canonical literature and the production of paintings and illuminated manuscripts. In contrast to the conventional notion of canonical uh, Buddhist texts serving as the origin of iconographic elements in Buddhist art, looking at sutras and ritual texts through a more expansive lens would allow, us, would allow us to consider a multitude of interpretations from diverse sources. For example, according to a Waterland Ceremony ritual manual that Dr. Zhang cites in her paper, both monks and nuns participated in the rituals, but many Kamnodo depict only monks. So how can, how can we explain this discrepancy, discrepancy between text and image is what I'm asking. Explanations for this discrepancy between ritual text and image could potentially be found in sources other than prescriptive Buddhist texts. The exploration of secular art forms as well as literary works such as novels, songs, or Dharma talks as potential sources of inspiration for Buddhist visual culture could be an avenue to investigate further. I would also like to ask both presenters about the ritual function, place of enshrinement, and audience of the discussed artworks. While reading Dr. Shin's paper, I was wondering about the ritual context in which these royally commissioned paintings were used and the special context in which these paintings might have been enshrined. And Dr. Shin's interpretation that the female patrons intended to convey a political message raises questions about the intended audience and their reactions to these visual narratives. Most importantly, why did the Queen Dowager and Queen choose this particular subject matter to pray for the well-being of the royal family? And if I may dare to suggest a direction for both presenters to further explore, it might be to look at the aesthetic preferences of female patrons and their preferences for specific materials and motifs. While the focus of both papers was on the depictions and the activities of women, it might be promising to use a comparative approach that discerns the separities in the scope, in the type, and the material of Buddhist paintings and sculptures financed by male and female patrons. And we have seen um, some research in this regard actually by the presenters of the second panel who were talked about embroidery. Such a comparative approach um, could potentially illustrate whether these preferences align um, with or differ from the situation in Edo, Japan, or Qing, China. And um, Yu Hang Li and other scholars in um, North America have actually discussed quite extensively gendered ritual practices in, um, in the Qing realm. Again, I'm delighted and honored to have had the opportunity to engage with both papers. Um, I would like to thank the organizers again for inviting me um, to contribute to this conference um, by discussing these two papers. Um, both papers undeniably demonstrate the depth and complexity, complexity of current Korean Buddhist art scholarship. And I eagerly look forward to the presenters' publications on these captivating themes in the near future. Thank you very much. Let's first hear from Kwang Yi Shin. Ah, yes. Uh, Mahastila Sayim께서 좋은 질의 해주셔서 일단 감사드립니다. 아 제가 질문은 저에게 크게 세 가지를 해주셨는데 이제 제가 이 자리에서 답변을 뭐제 의견대로 답변을 드릴 수 있는. I think I received three questions, and I think I'd be able to answer one of them. And for the last one, as 
to methodology of my research, I will definitely take that into account and um, try to adopt that uh, recommendation. So let me try to answer the first question. As far as I uh, understand, the first question was about the iconography uh, has some of the characteristics uh, in the early Joseon period. So from the Far East Asian context, what kind of meaning does it carry? And what kind of relationship does it have uh, with the uh, gender? So I guess the question was focused on the meaning of these uh, icons. And as I have mentioned in my presentation, the iconographic and also gender characters of the 15th century, in order to uh, compare that, I have compared them with the Goryeo uh, pieces. However, the Goryeo pieces were only available in Ojebi Jongjeon, and these were only a part. So I wasn't able to uh, identify a trend in the uh, Goryeo pieces. But Ojebi Jongjeon, even if it is just an example, if you look at the icon iconographies, uh, you can see that it really follows the uh, Buddhist scriptures um, as this. And um, in the case of, it is very close to the traditional iconographies of China. So it, it follows the scripture suit. So you can see that um, it doesn't really, well, that was the difference that I was able to identify. And if you compare with Ming Dai Ming Dynasty or some of the other Chinese dynasty work, early 15th century Buddhist iconographies was my focus, but as to the impact it had uh, going forward, I wasn't able to deal with it in my presentation due to lack of time. But uh, as my research shows, the eight phases uh, woodblock uh, print, there, were, uh, there was a great influence in the Korean um, eight phase prints the sitting up on the throne uh, under the tree, the Maya, that iconography, we're not sure if that meaning was uh, well understood or depicted, but there are other researches on uh, the birth of Buddha painting. It is in Japan. And after it moved to Japan, there were a lot of uh, distributions in different versions. Uh, some were colored, and there were different versions of paintings. So the eight-phase painting itself uh, was copied. It was uh, repeatedly printed. So if you look at the iconography, it was distributed in Korea, and it was also distributed in Japan as well. But uh, the early phase uh, iconography meaning, it, I think it would be difficult to say that the meaning itself was understood in the same manner. It, I think what we should focus is that it was more uh, proliferated. But um, one thing that I found out during my research was in the beginning, I focused on Maya. But when you look at uh, the painting on uh, leaving, there is no scene where uh, the prince is actually leaving, but there are two uh, chairs side by side, and that side by side empty chairs have continued on till late Joseon. But um, I have asked other people studying um, other countries and other periods, there were no such cases. So the iconographic characteristic for the Korean. Buddhist paintings, um, they do exist, um, and how we can interpret that from the context of Far East Asia and how to uh, apply meaning, uh, to draw out meaning from that, I think is another uh, level of uh, research. But I do believe that there has been some level of impact in the East Asian Buddhist art. And um, I would like to start stop here, and um, I will try to complement um, some of the things that I w want to say in my later papers. And as to the painting of the birth and painting of the leaving, uh, the eight-phase uh, 
painting of 15th century, there are two pieces, and um, there is a possibility that it could be one of the eight phase painting, but I just called it a Buddhist painting. It could have been the eight phase, and the eight pieces, where they were enshrined, and how they were used, um, I think was the question. 15th century, 16th century, uh, some of the paintings that were uh, paid, uh, commissioned were used, one in the shrine in the royal court, and two right outside of the court to uh, of where the um, the court ladies of the previous, the deceased kings lived, and also uh, the sh the shrines outside of the royal court area. But I think the ones that I have been dealing with were positioned within the court, with um, because at the time uh, it was commissioned by somebody as powerful as Song Zhong himself, Chong Hee Wang Hu. She was um, the queen dowager who was as powerful as the deceased king. So uh, it's my conjecture, but. I think one of the reasons why this uh, piece was commissioned was, of course, uh, it was made as a condolence to the deceased kings, but at the same time, I think there was a uh, prayer element for Song Jung to uh, continue his power and for the well-being of the country. Uh, to the dynasty, so I do not believe some that kind of painting would be placed outside of the court. But today we're talking more about gender, so I focused on Maya and Kui, but there were other uh, characters like Che Sok Chun, Jung Ban Wang. There were different motifs, and um, it is a, it is actually written. So why were those um, names written? Well, we can only assume for now, but the court. Oh, sorry. Uh, could you please uh, keep your discussion short? Yes, yes. So I believe uh, it could also be. It was also used internally. So yes, I I will have to cut it short. Um, for the additional information, I will try to deliver them through my paper. Thank you. Uh, the year. Then, moving on, uh, I will uh, make my response. So, perhaps I was too focused on the reproduced image, but I think uh, Professor Schiller uh, gave me suggestions for a broader perspective. I need to carry on more research to give you a full response, but if I may just briefly answer your questions. Well, just, I'm not. Sh I think I would like to clarify the questions for the sake of the audience. So the representation of pigu mo male monks and female monks piguni, the distinction between the two groups uh, became less and less distinct, and the existence of piguni was diminished in the representation. Uh, so. The perhaps discussion on the gap between reality and representation was the first question. And second is the function of the enshrinement of the painting. So first, the first question, Kamnodo, in itself, became a permanent uh, installation in the halls. The circumstances when it was produced and when it was commissioned and many factors that influence the choice of iconography needs to be considered, but mostly we need to look at the acceptance of the painting among the audience from a gender perspective. So in a broader sense, under a Confucian society, there were clear gender roles and there is a disciplining aspect 
of such values, but it clashes with the Buddhist teachings. And there were interests involved of the monastic communities to commission and produce uh, Kamnudu, and all of these are blended in the Kamnudu. So for the monastic community's perspective, the theme of a son who commissions this painting to uh, save one's mother was a theme that was welcomed by everyone. So the motherly love is a theme that penetrates all Kamrodo. But Pigu Ni, uh, female nuns who left the secular world to join the community and is one of the f four groups of followers, and they are often the ones who are playing drums in the Buddhist rituals, but they're sort of vaguely represented or they're kind of illustrated as male monks, while the title includes Piguni. So Piguni no longer becomes an important motive to be represented or illustrated. So this was encouraged by the overall social, uh, societal um, atmosphere and conditions, and also the female entertainers, the female shamans. And court ladies are some motives that became more and more pronounced with the past of time. So Buddhist paintings are displayed in public space in the temples. So perhaps to encourage continued commission and sponsoring, I think they started to uh, leave and portray what people wanted to see. So I'm viewing women as an object of viewing. So they were portrayed as um, motives to incur or revoke pleasure memories such as festivals. So that is what the images uh, portrayed. But women as agents of patronage and commissioners uh, are quite different. And we did not have much research going on viewing women as agents of patronage, but going beyond genres. In fact, I think we need to look deeper into the female patrons across all classes, and I will definitely reflect your feedback uh, while doing so. I will be very brief uh, due to the time, but I will uh, fully address the questions in my future papers. I, yes, well, if you have additional questions, then we could use the time after the second uh, discussion has finished her discussion. So yes, please bear with us. And now we will move on to the discussion on the session two presentations, inviting Professor Chisova. Um, you well. Um, if no one gives me a sign, I will just continue. Thank you. Um, I'm very grateful. Oh, excuse me, I think something went wrong. No, it's fine. It was the interpreter's booth. It's okay. Grateful. Oh, okay. No, uh, something went off on my screen. I'm very grateful for the invitation to participate in this conference as a discussant. And I must say right away that I know nothing about Korean Buddhism uh, and the fascinating sources and the light they shed on women's active role as commissioners or potentially producer, producers of uh, Buddhist art, this was really eye-opening to me. And I thank the two authors who submitted their papers uh, for me to read and whose wonderful presentations we just listened to. Uh, so in her paper, uh, Boyon An um, illuminates the process of uh, creating an embroidered kasaya, uh, which is captured in the inscription of this uh, finished piece. Um, and we learned that it was created by a certain anonymous lady pak based on the painting design by Ung Sok. Uh, and finally, based on the advising or coaching of Hebung. Uh, this artifact and this inscription are really fascinating because many of the kasaya, as the author tells us, were looted in the 19th century, so we don't have any identifying information attached to them, which was on purpose excised by their illicit traders. So, so this is really a unique source that leads us to think about the role of women in um, Buddhist art. 
Um, I think I um, have a few questions and all of them are really questions of curiosity. I'm just hoping to learn more about the context of Buddhist art. And I realized that we are pressed with time. Therefore, I will just select several questions out of the more questions that I have actually included in writing. So first of all, uh, I'm a complete outsider and I would be really grateful if you could explain quickly what is that process of coaching? Or is it advising? Is it witnessing, as the interpreter actually mentioned? Uh, so what, what is that process? What does it mean? Um, and also, just logistically speaking, how was that triangulation achieved of the person who either creates or commissions art? How does she get access uh, of uh, the design? Uh, and then where in the process does the final coaching or kind of uh, the final moment of this witnessing or approval, how does it occur? Uh, my second question is about uh, kind of the different types of offerings that women uh, could make. Um, I realized that um, today all of the presenters actually discussed uh, very high-end offerings uh, that were made in the form of paintings, embroidery or painted embroidery. Do you have at all, again, I'm thinking of the work of Yu Hang Li um, that I found also very interesting. And uh, I'm just curious in Korean context, do we have any other simpler objects that were made by other women that would also testify to their Buddhist engagement? Or do we only have access to this very high-end objects? Uh, my third question is kind of related to the second, and it's a question of archive and uh, the light it sheds on the status of women uh, patrons of Buddhist monasteries. I think in the morning uh, we heard wonderful presentations. Uh, the earlier presentations were about the queens uh, who uh, commissioned paintings. We know there were palace women. Uh, we know that even women of lower status, such as Saddam, could also make a pledge. So could you possibly circumscribe what kind of records exist about women's patronage outside of inscriptions on the devotional objects? Uh, and from these records, what would be more or less the demographic? Do we just have Lady Park as a woman who doesn't belong to the palace? Do we have other lay women? What do we know about them um, and about their patronage and engagement with Buddhist art? Uh, my fourth question is uh, about the status of uh, Buddhist art that was commissioned by the royal family. Uh, I, su I suppose these objects uh, would lend prestige to the temples that received them. So I was wondering if these temples would make an effort to highlight uh, the objects, the devotional objects that were received through royal commission. Uh, would there be, would their prominence be highlighted through placement? Uh, would there be extra rituals uh, that would be involved in the consecration of these objects? Would there be texts written about them? Uh, and my final um, question is actually about palace women. Uh, I'm very interested in palace women myself, uh, but I knew nothing about their Buddhist activities. And I found it interesting uh, how um, um, the author of this paper mentioned uh, the kind of the commissioning activities of the palace women. And we can see that they make devotional objects uh, with the purpose of making merit on behalf of their family members. As we know, palace women, they kind of existed outside of the lineage society because they left for the palace work, they were not allowed to marry. At the same time, we know that they relied on their families. They had to rely on them in sickness and in death. Uh, and I was curious, if we look at palace women's inscriptions on Buddhist devotional objects, what kind of connections, what kind of relatives get mentioned? I know that earlier presentations actually uh, mentioned that it's usually parents, but do we see other kin inscribed in this Buddhist object? And uh, how could those inscriptions kind of tell us how palace women defined their kinship context? Uh, so again, thank you very much. And I will move on uh, to the next uh, paper. Uh, so, uh, Dahi Jong's paper uh, focuses on a different medial iteration of Buddhist embroidery as meritorious uh, offering. Uh, and this time we are looking at the painted uh, kasaya, uh, uh, basically a representation of an embroidered textile. 
Uh, while we do not have explicit uh, note of who commissioned the piece, it seems to be consort Om. Uh, and um, uh, the author then proceeds to suggest uh, that this particular piece was created in order to bolster uh, the prestigious status of this consort, uh, who actually uh, achieved unprecedented elevation uh, within uh, the royal court. Um, we learn also from this paper uh, that uh, it's a curious painting of a textile uh, and the reason for this interesting mediation is uh, perhaps the shortage of embroidery labor inside the palace. Uh, so I just have uh, kind of three questions uh, to the author of this paper, again, questions of curiosity. And first of all, I wonder if the author could unpack in more detail the connection between royal women's empowerment and Buddhist art. Uh, so we learned from the earlier presentations that in the 14th and 15th century, uh, Korean queens would commission paintings that would actually depict women's active and important role. But here at this point uh, in the kind of early 20th century, we're moving simply to a depiction of an embroidered object. So how can we actually contextualize this visual representation against other existing examples of royal women's patronage uh, of Buddhist art. Um, I'm also curious about um, kind of when we look at the early 20th century about the context of this um, conspicuous self-fashioning, if we can say. So in the early 20th, kind of at the turn of the 20th century, uh, did Buddhist temples become these public spaces for this kind of self-fashioning? Who would be the audience, actually, uh, of this particular piece uh, commissioned by Consort Om, right? Uh, so how exactly would this particular painting uh, turn into a cultural capital that could then be converted into political capital and give added prestige to Consort Om? I wonder if you could just set up the scene and talk more about Buddhist monastery at the turn of the 20th century. Um, the second question uh, is uh, regarding how uh, exactly Consort Om seeks to define herself as someone who embodies the female virtue of embroidery, which is an essential feminine virtue. There is this very interesting multimedia transfer. This is not a real embroidery. She does not do it herself. So how does this simulacrum of an embroidered piece allow Consort Om to actually claim this womanly virtue. I was wondering if we could uh, even uh, think of it uh, simply as a kind of, um, as a statement of modesty, uh, because again, if we compare what Consort Om does uh, to the earlier 14th, 15th century commissions of painting, this seems to be a rather modest offering. So rather than actually claiming embroidery per se, which is kind of lost in this piece, uh, is it simply um, her stepping into the kind of conventional idea of what a woman's Buddhist offering could be like? So are we really talking about the appropriation of the skill of embroidery? Uh, and finally, uh, related to the second uh, question, I'm kind of uh, really curious about whether in the case of Korean women, uh, in as far as the sources uh, can tell us, um, what was the importance of women's bodies in the making of these devotional objects? Again, I'm quite influenced, of course, by Yuhang Lee's uh, work in which she talks about how women use their bodies to embody Guanyin. But in the Korean examples, uh, we basically don't seem to have that visceral embodied connection. Uh, so uh, can you speak a little bit more about this? Do we have uh, any devotional objects that we know were actually made by women? Was it important to make, make things yourself to claim greater merit? Or would it actually perhaps be considered inappropriate for a woman to display the product of her labor publicly? in a monastery, given the prescription of women's domesticity. So I will stop here. Thank you very much. Again, I learned a great deal. And I'm sorry um, that my questions are kind of uh, just questions of curiosity. I do hope to learn more from your answers. 
네, 고맙습니다. Thank you. 그, 원래 토... uh, I think the question was actually cut short compared to uh, what you have submitted to us. Uh, so thank you very much for helping us keep the time. Um, so, Ms. An, if you can first uh, take the microphone to answer the question. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Chizoba. I think I've received six questions. I am not an art historian, so I hope I got the questions right. Uh, I will try my best to answer your questions. So regarding your first question, the uh, actual process of um, verifying um, the creation of the Buddhist painting. So, so far, I have been able to look at the first uh, reports. Uh, so there are some writings uh, on the, the painting, the name, and the location. Uh, and some of the earlier ones have some uh, verification at the bottom. Um, and um, as time went by, uh, the person's name goes up. So the person who climbs up that credit, uh, I believe, is a person who had um, the rank up. So I think that can also show us the a chronography of the painting. And so when I looked at some of the uh, evidences, um, I think um, trying to verify the evidence um, has some discrepancies and how can we have some uh, reliable um, evidence. So in the scripture, for instance, The Chambul Myonghu, there are so many scriptures with Chambul Myonghu, and we uh, interpret the names of the, the Buddhas, 25 Buddhas, and uh, 50 uh, Bodhisattvas, and we look at the order. So I think it required a lot of uh, study on the Buddhist philosophy. So if we had, um, because uh, it was not repeated, before uh, can we actually verify whether they have been carried on uh, after the previous uh, painter had uh, had been deceased? But I think even after departure, uh, the previous work had been carried on. And for the female nuns, I think that was the second question. As I have already mentioned in my presentation, uh, the embroidery can be uh, small art, uh, artifacts, but because they are textile, Uh, aesthetically, if um, the condition is good and if it's pretty to look at, it would make the exhibition and it would make um, the picture books, but um, there weren't many cases that were introduced. And um, usually just the front part is exhibited, but actual uh, re records are in the back. So we had to look at um, the pouches the back of the pouches to identify the names and but um, for now we have not been able to find a lot of records because only the front part of the textile uh, images were shared but uh, I don't think we can say that this was confined to elites but um, I do believe that um, the patron will have been a person of wealth. And Daejeong 8, um, there were two pieces that were uh, created, and they are one set created of two pieces. One is a hanging type, and the other one is uh, is is 주지 벽봉, and the other one is 화주 벽봉. So these are the two uh, 
commission two monks that commissioned. So I think that one set was commissioned. Uh, as so we can definitely tell who it was commissioned by and who produced it. So we were able to see that. But in the case of the Bukjangnang and Bulbon, material-wise, uh, they are textile and embroidery, and they usually use Hangul, Bukso. And in there is a Tarani uh, pouch. In the front part, there is a embroidery in um, curry, uh, in Chinese character, but in the back, uh, all the, the records were written in uh, Hangul. So that was one case that we were able to see in an exhibit in the Korean Museum um, of Craft. So at the temples, maybe they were used to uh, it's very difficult to say whether it was used to boast of um, their possessions at the temple, but um, there were many Buddhist paintings um, due to the social trend per se. And in from 1897, with the birth of Yongqin, King Yongqin, and uh, due to uh, the wars, uh, I think there were many cases where people were just uh, praying for peace and Yongju Temple, Tongdo Temple, these were the hub temples at that time. So I don't think this was uh, something to uh, boast of their power. And in the mid Joseon century, Dopo or Jeogori of Songgang Temple, there are many um, garments. So when the court uh, ladies, their ranks go up, they can uh, commission these things to pray for the peace of the court. But Mangbu, Mangbu, Mangsa, and also uh, the deceased senior court lady, and also not just the deceased people, but also they can also um, pray for their peace of the living family members. So until early 20th century, uh, there were uh, the trend of wishing for one's well-being continued. And because um, so uh, the patrons were not um, just but for by the court members and they were for uh, targeted for their family members, uh, deceased or living, and in the case of Cheongyongsa Kasado Hangnimhawe, in the area there is a Sanggung Putotap. This is where the court ladies lived, right outside of the court. So they uh, kept connection with their family, but they did not live together with the family. So the court ladies uh, formed a uh, area where they lived together right outside of the the, temp the, the palace. And um, embroidery and textile work was considered a female job. And having said that, though, uh, creating embroidered Buddhist uh, art. Um, some men are also participated in China. Both men and women participated in these projects. And embroidery takes a lot of um, meditation because they have to uh, work on it. One needle, one, uh, one needle by one needle. So and also, vocationally, there were men who uh, focused on embroidery. So I don't think I mean, embroidery was uh, only confined to women. And also, there were cases where temples have asked the uh, embroidery uh, craftsmen to work on some of the Buddhist work. Thank you. So I will try my best to answer the questions as thoroughly as possible. But first, thank you for good questions. The royal uh, women represented themselves uh, in many precedents. Uh, and how is Kazateng different from those? Well, even 
before Kasa Teng, uh, women represented themselves through art, but perhaps the Buddhist figures or deities would assume the hairstyle of women, uh, and although they were male, but usually, so it was women portraying themselves in the Buddhist paintings. But Kasa Teng shows a lady um, through an image of an object, setting it apart from previous Buddhist paintings. Uh, it seems that by owning an object or by exhibiting an object, uh, she believes she could present her taste and identity. Uh, one of the key uh, examples is Chekado, which was popular in late Joseon. So in late Joseon, as Kaza Ting shows, uh, the visual culture of representing oneself through objects was widespread. So this makes Kaza Ting different from like other traditional ways of women presenting themselves in Buddhist art. I will move on to the audience of Kaza Ting. As uh, Ms. An just mentioned in her presentation, Hebong advised Kasaya, and they met with uh, Kim Jong Hee in Suraksan. Uh, it sh shows how the Suraksan mountain area was a cultural uh, space for the noblemen. Uh, so noblemen would enjoy their times in the Suraksan mountain, and they would visit temples to talk to monks. So these noble men were well aware that embroidery was associated with female virtues. And as we could see in the appeals uh, for uh, her promotion to empress, we could see that these noble men were major opinion leaders at the time. And probably she aimed it for these noble men who visit Suraksan to see this uh, Kasa Teng. And also royal women themselves were uh, audience for Kasa Teng. Uh, there is a Sangung's grave in Hangnim An in Suraksan and it was frequented Hangliman was frequented by uh, court women. So although the Sangguns did not submit appeals like noblemen, they still were key opinion leaders within the palace. So I think Lady Um aimed to uh, target uh, these uh, peop influential people in and out of the palace to uh, convey her messages through Kasa Teng in a public space called uh, uh, public space temple. Now, let's see how Kasa Teng relates to the virtues of Om. Uh, we need to look at some other commissioned works of different genres. Om um, uh, commissioned 20 or so uh, Buddhist paintings, but these are Kwebul, Shinjungdo, Gamnodo, which are all paintings that do not directly revoke the femininity of her. They're just general commissioned works. So Kasa Teng is a very distinctive case, uh, even among the projects commissioned by, by Om. And she specifically went with uh, Kasa Teng to uh, present her femininity. Well, Kasa Teng is a painting, so it does not uh, showcase the embroidery skill or craft of Om. But in late Joseon, uh, Embroidery was a symbol that represented female virtue. So by representing Kasa in uh, Kasa Teng, uh, Lady Om uh, used it as a measure to convey her feminine uh, virtues, uh, which she very much intended to do. And uh, the works of Yu Hang Li uh, that perhaps points to how female body is related to labor and practice. And she asked if this has any implications for my own paper. In fact, Kasa Tang is different from uh, the works Yuan Li mentions, uh, that it does not directly t trace back to the labor or uh, practices of women. It was, Kasa Tang itself was produced by male monks who produced Buddhist paintings. Then, leading on to the next question, 
Is it more conducive to building merit if one engages in the labor of embroidery oneself? My answer would be no. Usually, consorts and queens uh, produced large scale embroidery like subur, but there is very slim chance that they actually perform the craft themselves. Instead, they employed the needle workers in the court. And consorts and queens perhaps uh, crafted a little part of the entire work. But the fact that they did not perform uh, the entire work probably was not interpreted as a factor that would diminish the merit that they would be earning because it showcases their ability to, their wealth and their status, their ability to employ these many um, needle workers and the fact that they were able to afford the high cost materials. So this was an offering that still well represented their status and wealth. And this, by just commissioning the projects probably uh, led to immense merit in their ways of thinking. So to end my comment in late Choson, the embroidery goes out of the boundaries of a household and goes into the public space. And is this rather inappropriate given the values of the time? Uh, this was another question. And as I have shown in my presentation, in noble families, the, uh, women made handbooks or notebooks that were covered with embroidered uh, art. Uh, this was enjoyed and appreciated by the male members of the noble families, even the king. So the virtue of women is directly tied to elevating the status of the household. So embroidery had to be confirmed and approved by more people. Uh, the embroidery craft itself is rather domestic, but the actual resultant uh, work, the piece, was intended for a public exhibition to start off with. And I think this applies to the case of Kasateng. Thank you. Yes, I tried to jump in, but she was very passionate in giving her answer, so I could not jump in and uh, cut her answer. Uh, so if you are okay, uh, Professor Maya Stiller. Well, since uh, Professor Silva is joining us virtually, why don't we first hear any comments if she may have on the presenter's answers and since uh, Professor Stiller, you are here, you can use a break to talk to them over break. And also, it's time for lunch. So why don't we use this time to uh, hand over the mic to uh, Professor Chizbova, Chizova. And do you have any comments on their answers? No, I think I won't take the time. For that. Thank, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm sure you have many lingering questions. And probably we have um, questions coming in online. I would like to ask uh, our coordinators to uh, gather and collect the questions uh, on Zoom and uh, give them to the presenters, which will help them in their future work. And if any uh, people, uh, anyone has questions in the floor, then please use the break time to directly pose the questions to the presenters. Can I now put this panel discussion to a close? Thank you very much.